Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I invite you to take your seats. This conference is called the Grand Strategy Summit for a reason. President Nixon was the ultimate grand strategist, marrying strategic purpose with power to yield significant positive results. We want to show you a brief film that gives an overview of how President Nixon approached foreign policy. This video is narrated by Ambassador Robert O'Brien, who served as the 27th National Security Advisor and was recently elected Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Richard Nixon Foundation. The voice that you are about to hear is that of Ambassador O'Brien. From his earliest days, Richard Nixon was an instinctive grand strategist. Born in Southern California in 1913, there was little in Dick's humble background that presaged the worldly statesman and global thinker he would become. But the young man on that small citrus farm that would become his home was a diligent student of history and geography. He had a logical mind with a visionary bent. He was intuitive. Dick had an extraordinary capacity for study and hard work. Over a career spanning almost half a century in Congress, as Vice President, as President, and as a private citizen, Richard Nixon traveled the world. He corresponded with and met many of the world's leaders. He was particularly interested in those who also thought in grand strategic terms. Yoshida, Adenauer, Ben-Gurion, Lee Kuan Yew, De Gaulle, and of course, Winston Churchill. In 1947, his first year in Congress, Nixon made dozens of speeches to convince his isolationist constituents of the importance of the Marshall Plan. That effort carried with it significant political risk. While he failed to change public opinion, Nixon was widely admired for the courage of his convictions. And at the next election, he ran unopposed. In 1967, Nixon wrote an article for Foreign Affairs, Asia After Vietnam. In it, he projected and analyzed a bold new grand strategy for America in the post-Vietnam world. In the summer of his first year as president, he outlined a comprehensive new strategic basis for American involvement in regional conflicts. This became known as the Nixon Doctrine. What made Nixon a, grand, a great grand strategist is that he was not, he, he of course was perfectly willing to address the problem of the day, but what occupied him most in the conversations that he and I conducted practically every day on what was supposed to go on was the definition of how we could be both strong and visionary. Too often our domestic debate is conducted as a debate between people who want to do away with weapons and others who think you can do everything with weapons. And Nixon's great strength was his determination uh, to link the two together. In fact, he sent it in the third or fourth week of his administration, he sent out a memorandum to all departments concerned with foreign policy to tell them he wanted to link the various objectives almost like an artistic measure. In 1972, his transformational trip to China and his groundbreaking trip to the Soviet Union opened new strategic vistas for American foreign policy. In October 1973, Nixon saved Israel during the Yom Kippur War 
and he checked Soviet expansion in the region. The next year, he became the first American president to visit Israel. To Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, making possible a new footing for U.S. policy in the Middle East. During the last two decades of his life, Richard Nixon traveled and spoke and wrote, urging the importance of grand strategic thinking for American foreign policy. In his last eight years alone, he wrote four books describing and refining his strategic vision. In 1985, 18 years after writing Asia After Vietnam, Nixon looked back in strategic terms. It's true that dominoes, uh, when we normally play the game, one falls and the others fall in order. But when we speak of dominoes internationally, when a domino falls in one part of the world, it affects, through reverberation, dominoes in other parts of the world as well. Let me put it more precisely. Uh, in addition to Cambodia and Laos, which have fallen, uh, we have a situation where, as a result of what happened in Vietnam, uh, the American defeat there and withdrawal, uh, the victory by the communists, uh, that the Soviet Union was emboldened, and the United States, in terms of its policies, was discouraged. And around the world, in Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, the dominoes fell. And I say that was a direct result of the failure in Vietnam. In 1992, Nixon's analysis of the strategic situation in the new post-communist Russia was prophetic. Well, Russia at the present time is at a crossroads. Uh, it is often said that the, the Cold War is all over and that the uh, West has won it. That's only half true, uh, because what has happened is that the communists have been defeated, uh, but the ideas of freedom now are on trial. If they don't work, there, there will be a reversion to not communism, which has failed, but what I call a new despotism, which would pose a mortal danger uh, to the rest of the world, because it would have be infected with the virus of Russian imperialism, which of course has been a characteristic of Russian foreign policy for centuries. In 1993, he analyzed Asia after the Cold War. The 80-year-old elder statesman traveled to Russia and met with President Clinton on his return. He also visited Ukraine, Poland, the Czech Republic, Japan, Korea, and China that year. At the beginning of 1994, Nixon returned to Moscow. Back home, he made a long private and personal report to President Clinton. He gave a general description of the situation in a New York Times op-ed. Sadly, less than a month later, he was gone. His last book, outlining a grand strategy to take America beyond peace, would be published posthumously. Richard Nixon's legacy as one of America's foremost geopolitical strategists endures today. I'm often asked, what would President Nixon do about this issue or that problem? Well, who better to attempt to answer that than Newt Gingrich, who served as the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. He formed the contract with America to propel the Republican wave in 1994, and as an historian in his own right and the author of a staggering 41 books, he is a master of marrying politics with history to enable a better understanding of both. He is joined today by Ambassador Callista Gingrich, who of course served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, and thank you for being here with us, Madam Ambassador. He's a great friend of the Nixon Foundation, and please join me in welcoming Speaker Newt Gingrich. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all very, very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, and I want to say to Ed and Tricia, we're delighted to be here. Uh, we actually drove in watching the video that was made for your 50th anniversary, which is a remarkable video and uh, <clears throat> amazingly beautiful. 
So uh, Richard Nixon had a huge impact on my life. People often forget in retrospect that Nixon was the preeminent modern Republican uh, in, in the 40s and the 50s uh, and the early 60s, and that he represented a kind of very hardworking, very professional, very serious commitment to growing a Republican Party coming out from under the period of FDR and the domination of Roosevelt. Uh, <clears throat> I had the great opportunity uh, to go and visit with him several times when we were trying to think through how to become a majority. And he said two things that profoundly affected us and that uh, were, were clearly part of how we were able to put the whole majority together. Uh, first, he said that the House Republicans are boring. <laughs> this was in the early 80s. And he said, and I can't quite imitate his voice, but you can hear it in your head. He said, they have always been boring. When I was there in 1946, they were boring. And if you intend to create a majority, you have got to learn to be interesting. And he said, I recommend that you get a group together that decide to work on being interesting and that meet regularly. And in many ways, the Conservative Opportunity Society came out of that very experience. The other thing which he had said to Guy Vanderjack, who at that time was a congressman from Michigan and chairman of the Congressional Campaign Committee, and he repeated to me was, as long as you are hidden away in the political news, you cannot reach enough people to create a majority. And therefore, you have to find a way to become dynamic enough and exciting enough that you break through in the news media. And uh, I, I thought about that advice the week before the 1994 election, when in fact we had the cover of both Time and Newsweek. And to show you how little things change, the title of both covers was angry white men, uh, because that's the only way the media could deal with it. I later continued uh, his advice of getting in the news media because about a month later, time had me as Scrooge holding Tiny Tim's broken crutch. It wasn't enough that I stole the crutch. It was a broken crutch, and it was uh, entitled, uh, How Mean Will Gingrich's America Be to the Poor? And the following week, uh, Newsweek had me as a Dr. Zeus figure entitled The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Now, one of the things I think I'd learned from the many years of studying Nixon was that, in fact, the average American could see through the news media. And so what people got out of those two covers was, oh, Gingrich wants to reform welfare, which was like a 90% issue. So actually, ironically, neither Time nor Newsweek hurt us. They actually helped us. Uh, by communicating that. Um, I also have to say, for a long time, I, I was amazed. He, he came down to speak to the House Republicans at one point, and he had this knack of taking you around the world. And it was astonishing. And I saw him do it two or three times, and I finally realized all it meant was that he was really good at geography. Because once you had a, the map in your head, you could start in Japan and go through Korea to China. You know, and the map would lead you through the whole conversation. But to the average listener, it seemed so amazing that he knew all these things. Well, he did know all these things. But he was able to organize them without any notes because he was simply relying on the map. And that gave him the outline of, of what he was talking about. Um, when I was growing up, and, and I, I first got involved, actually, in the late 50s, I, my first really big campaign activity was as a volunteer for the Nixon Lodge campaign in 1960 in Columbus, Georgia, at a time when there were no Republicans outside the mountains. Uh, the mountains were Republican because of the Civil War. But so, so Nixon in that period, for a young Republican, was the dominant figure. He was hardworking. He was intelligent. He had thought enormously, again, while we're going to talk about grand strategy internationally, he had thought very long and hard about the necessary politics of becoming a majority and working a way out from under the Rooseveltian majority. Uh, and so I, I read his speeches, I read books about him, I watched him. Uh, 
And I would say in terms of the confusion about this week's election, that the number one advice I have for all of you is to remember Nixon's own career. 1952, he almost gets kicked off the ticket and saves himself with a brilliant nationwide televised speech, later known as the Checker speech, because uh, the high point emotionally was talking about his dog, Checkers. Um, he then uh, ends up uh, in a very difficult, challenging situation with Nelson Rockefeller in 1959 and 1960, uh, gets to be the nominee. He then, in what's one of the longest nights of my political career, loses the presidency by an extraordinarily narrow margin, and I personally think uh, that both uh, Illinois and Texas were stolen. Um, then he comes back to run for governor, and the people of California figure out that, in fact, he's a national figure. He's not, a, he, you know, he's not focused on California. He's focused on international relations and on the things you do at a national level. So he loses to Pat Brown and has the famous press conference in which he says, you're not going to have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. He then leaves, goes to New York. Everybody sort of assumes he's out of politics, but he's not out of politics. Because of his just unbelievable work ethic, he's out there campaigning. He's the one senior Republican who stays with Goldwater and supports Goldwater, which leads the conservative wing of the party to be grateful to him. He comes back and campaigns tirelessly in 1966. David Broder wrote a book on the 66 campaign and, and, and just points out how, how many hours a day Nixon put in to crisscrossing the country, helping candidates, getting on the telephone. Um, then he wins the nomination in 68. And in a very narrow race, beats Hubert Humphrey. And four years later, wins one of the largest majorities in American history, carries all but one state. And then the tragedy of Watergate occurs. Well, if you think about that, I'm just suggesting to you, this process goes on. This is not a Polaroid camera. This is a motion picture. And things will continue to evolve and continue to change. And Richard Nixon did a great deal to make this a much better world. Now, I think if you're going to talk about grand strategy, you're going to talk about foreign policy. And I was delighted that the, uh, the video you showed included Henry Kissinger. Um, Clist and I both are very fond of Henry and spent a good bit of time with him. And he just wrote a great new book called Leadership, which I recommend to all of you. And the chapter on Nixon is remarkable. Partially, I mean, one of the, again, if you're Henry Kissinger and you're 99 years old and you've done all the things he's done, you can write a book on leadership and each chapter is about somebody you know personally. So when he describes de Gaulle, he was in the room. When he describes Adenauer, he was in the room. But his chapter on Nixon, who of course he knew intimately and worked with intimately, I think was very relevant to uh, this uh, conversation and, and to the whole notion of a grand strategy summit. And I tried to put together some, some key ideas uh, that sort of explain how Nixon approached these things. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that probably more than any president, and maybe since Lincoln, Nixon was essentially an intellectual. His political activities, his political skills were a function of learned habits. But in his heart, he was a thinker. And in fact, uh, he was somebody who liked to be able to have quiet time to really ponder. And he wanted to do big things that would genuinely make the world better. And he wanted to have big strategies. And I think one of the keys to remember is, you know, when you, when, when you have the current cycle of leadership uh, for whom lo long distance planning is Thursday, um, it's impossible in a very short period of time to develop and implement a grand strategy. Grand strategies require a bold vision and then a lot of specific incremental steps. And I think it's, it happens very rarely. Uh, it involves people who are remarkable. And Nixon was one of those people. And he had thought about it a long time. He thought about it, I think, before World War II when he was becoming a lawyer and studying history. He thought about it while he was serving in the military during the war. He thought about it as a junior congressman. Uh, and if you go back and you look at his work, uh, he was very methodically committed to a sophisticated anti-communism, uh, which, which required us to develop NATO, for example, required us to have a Marshall Plan, 
Well, these were not, you know, these were not the automatic right-wing things to do. And so Nixon is constantly bridging uh, the views of people back home with what he thinks is the historic necessity. And I, I would argue that one of the things Nixon did that is really underreported and misunderstood is he understood that power in the end comes from the American people. And so he spent a lot of his time communicating and building a solid majority, uh, both within the Republican Party and then ultimately in 1972 in the country at large. And the result was that he was able to sustain a policy. And frankly, had Watergate not occurred, we would have in essence won the war in Vietnam. We would not, we would not have had the domino effect he described. Uh, and we would have been a much safer and a much healthier world. But when you think about big things, this is somebody who, who was capable of thinking on the scale of, can I bring China into the game to balance off Russia? Now, at the time, that was just a remarkable decision and one which was potentially very controversial. And one of the things that Nixon understood, which makes him very much like, like Charles de Gaulle, is if you're going to be a great strategic leader, a lot of your biggest decisions are going to be secret. So the whole process of negotiating with China was essentially secret. And Kissinger tells this great story, which, which illustrates one of the key realities of American government, that I mean, Nixon understood that you could make a decision in the White House, but if you didn't drive the decision into the bureaucracy, it couldn't be implemented. And so they wanted to start the conversation with China and, and the place we had talked with the Chinese over the years had been Warsaw. And so Kissinger sent a message to the American ambassador to Poland to go to a cocktail party and have an indirect conversation with the Chinese ambassador. And the American ambassador refused to do it. And Kissinger said, went back at him a second time, and this is in the book and it's, it's truly fascinating. He went back to him a second time and said, look, we really want you to do this. Kissinger at the time was still National Security Advisor. And the guy's answer was, I'm the ambassador for the president. I'm not the ambassador for the National Security Advisor. At which point Kissinger told Nixon. And the following week, the ambassador to Poland flew home and walked into the Oval Office. And Nixon explained to him in apparently very vivid terms uh, that he, the president, expected the following things to happen and just wanted to know if they were going to happen with this ambassador or with the next ambassador. <laughs> At which point the guy said, oh, okay, that, I'll do it. <laughs> so they go through a process to show you an, an example of, of how secretive this was. They very carefully are reaching out to the Chinese and saying, you know, we, we, we would really like to sit down and talk. Now, the Chinese had become very unhappy with the Soviets. It's important to remember that when, when Khrushchev made his famous speech attacking Stalin, from the standpoint of the Chinese Communist Party, this was heresy. This was like Luther taking on the Catholic Church. The Chinese Communist Party, even to this day, loves Stalin and loves Lenin. And that's the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, which was founded by a group of people in, in Paris. And, and uh, Deng Xiaoping actually went to Lenin University for a year in the early 1920s, learning exactly how to run a Leninist party. So they, they were horrified at this, this kind of uh, heresy that's coming out of Moscow. Furthermore, they didn't trust the Soviets and thought that there was very likely to be a significant skirmish on, on the Chinese-Soviet uh, border. So they're interested, but everything's very secret. So Kissinger goes to, and this is all being planned by Nixon and Kissinger, to sit down every day and talk through what are we gonna do next. And if you think of Nixon as a chess player, thinking through how do I get what I want done, you have a much better understanding of how remarkable he was and how unlike most American politicians he was. And so they think through, Kissinger goes to visit in Pakistan and suddenly has a very severe illness and can't be seen in public for several days, which are the several days he flies into China from Pakistan. 
meets with the Chinese leadership, and they agree that Nixon will come to China. Now, it's hard for us at this stage to realize what an enormous revolution this was. But notice what Nixon is doing. He is simultaneously increasing the military pressure on the North Vietnamese, reaching out to the Chinese, and telling the Russians he'd like to come to Moscow, which, by the way, is also pretty good politics. So Nixon is going to have a decisive breakthrough in Vietnam. He's going to have the Chinese communists greeting him and get lots of good TV and, and uh, news media coverage. And then he's going to go to Moscow. And they get to a, a, a crisis point where the Soviets are very unhappy with what Nixon's doing. And basically, and this is, a, again, typical of Nixon and Kissinger, they basically say, look, if, if you don't want us to come, we don't have to come. You know, we, we don't think, see ourselves as big winners visiting Moscow. At which point Brezhnev probably says, oh, no, no, come on because they don't want Nixon to go only to China. So he's creating a balance of power, in effect, bringing China into the game as sort of an American ally to balance off the Soviets. Now, this is grand strategy. This is thinking ahead. At the same time, there are, there are key moments where Nixon has enormous courage and where he does things that, that people might have thought were a sign of unpredictability, but in fact, they were done to drive home certain messages. So for example, he deliberately went into Cambodia in what was called the Parrot's Beak to destroy the logistics system that the North Vietnamese had built in Cambodia because he wanted to send the signal that he was prepared to be ruthless and he was prepared to change the rules of the game if that's what it took. And when the North Vietnamese broke their word, Nixon launched the most severe bombing campaign of the entire Vietnam War. And within a matter of days, the North Vietnamese were saying, OK, we want to talk. We get it. Because Nixon was prepared to do whatever it took to get their attention. When the Soviets are backing Syria and Egypt against Israel, and the Israelis literally are running out of ammunition and potentially running out of aircraft. Nixon, first of all, opens up the lines against the wishes of the Pentagon, sends American equipment in considerable quantity and, and flies them in. And at the same time, when they get to a real crisis with uh, Kissinger and Nixon working together, they go to DEFCON 3, which is one step short of being prepared to go to war. Uh, to send a signal to the Soviets that the United States is going to stand up to them and that they cannot send Soviet forces into the Middle East. If you look at the Middle East under Johnson and the Middle East by the end of Nixon's time, it is amazing how much it has changed. The Soviets have been kicked out. Uh, you now have the Egyptians being to move towards recognizing Egypt, I mean recognizing Israel. You have a dramatically safer and more secure Israel, and you have American relationships based on strength. One of the things I think the American foreign policy establishment never quite understands is that in places like the Middle East, strength matters. If they think you're serious and they think you're real and they think you're reliable, you can get all sorts of things done. If they think you're weak or they think you're confused or they think you're unreliable, you can't get anything done. And it's not about personality. It's about a perception of your willingness in the real world to do the things that really matter. So I think there's a lot to be learned from Nixon. The challenge is finding leaders who are capable of this kind of systematic long-term planning and who are capable of thinking at this level. You know, one of the reasons when, when, I, when I read uh, Kissinger's new book on leadership, one of the things that really leaped out of me was, you know, you get very few people of this caliber. I mean, Lee Kuan Yew is extraordinary. And you saw the picture of Nixon with a much younger Lee Kuan Yew. Um, I once, uh, Kissinger once had me out to his farm uh, when Lee Kuan Yew was visiting. And uh, I asked, I said to him, uh, why were you able to be so successful in creating modern Singapore? And he said, well, you know, I was in Britain as a graduate student during 
Clement Attlee and the Socialist Party. And every time I got to a major decision in Singapore, I would ask myself, what would the Labour Party have done? I would then do exactly the opposite. <laughs> and it worked every single time. But somebody like Lee Kuan Yew is, is extraordinary. You, you look around the third world and the number of people who bring you modernization with freedom is very, very few. You look at de Gaulle, who is extraordinary. These, these, are, these are people, you know, the difference between the France of Macron and the France of de Gaulle is astonishing. And it's, one would have to ask whether or not a de Gaulle could function in modern France because he was such a nationalist, he was so willing to be responsible, to take deep positions, to be unpopular if necessary, and he was capable of thinking strategically. Uh, and I think this is the sort of thing that we, we have a deep lack of, I think at two levels in this country right now. We have an inability among people who do thinking to actually think seriously and to actually deal with the real world as it exists. We, we, we have a, a huge foreign policy establishment that insists on living in a fantasy world. Um, and therefore, they, they do things that don't work. I, I tell people one of the greatest problems with the modern foreign policy establishment is that they saw The Lion King and they thought it was a documentary. <laughs> and so, you know, they think lions and zebras dance and sing together. And we keep, in, in a Nixonian tradition, we keep trying to say to them, no, you know, lions actually eat zebras. And their answer is, I mean, you go talk to the current Secretary of State. I mean, their, their answer would be, no, no, didn't you see the movie? <laughs> and so they, they consistently can't, this is why you end up with things like Afghanistan, because they just lied to themselves. But they didn't know they were lying to themselves. They took all the, infra, the data and they ran it through this thing that said the world's really safe, the Taliban are really good guys, the, you know, we can really be partners. One of the keys to Nixon, I, th I think both domestically and in national security, was a really intense willingness to focus on the facts. Remember, he's taking a Republican party which had been historically in a deep minority status with the singular exception of Eisenhower, who was a, a national hero. The party's natural position is being in the minority and had been since 1932. And Nixon is calmly and methodically thinking through strategies that grow a much bigger party. And Pat Buchanan writes about this in, a, in several books on, 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 I think one of them is called Nixon's Wars. And the whole process of how do you put together the 1972 coalition? How do you suddenly grow a party, which I, I believe in the absence of, of Watergate, Nixon would have been extraordinarily successful and would in fact have created a majority party in the 70s. And the country would have been dramatically better off. It's truly one of the great tragedies. And I think one uh, which the left willfully created uh, because from their perspective, Nixon was such an enormous danger and such an enormous threat to their, their what had been what had seemed like a permanent majority. The, the other part of that, I think, is uh, it's very hard for the current generation, when you look back at Nixon's long career, to understand how bitterly the establishment hated him because he proved that Alger Hiss was a communist. And it just literally tore apart the fabric of the establishment because Alger Hiss was their guy. And even if he was a communist, he was an elegant communist. And he came from the right school and the right family. And it was just wrong to expose him. Now we know now, because after the fall of the Soviet Union, we got access for a brief period to their archives. And it turns out that at Yalta, uh, Alger Hiss actually goes to Stalin's railroad car at three o'clock in the morning and is given the highest civilian decoration that you can get. But the fact, and this is an important thing to remember about, about the, the left-wing establishment, which has been true consistently all the way back to the 1930s, when the New York Times won a Pulitzer Prize for a reporter in Moscow 
who was methodically lying about the Ukrainian famine. The left consistently tries to destroy people who don't share its fantasies. Because if we get into a conversation in which it's legitimate to describe the truth, the left will lose. And so what Nixon did more than any other politician of his period, I mean, you know, McCarthy was, was noisier and, and made a lot more charges, but McCarthy wasn't a serious person. McCarthy was just a really good demagogue. Nixon was a serious person who proved again and again, as he did in the brief period when he was out of public life and serving as a lawyer in New York and winning Supreme Court cases. Nixon was really a good lawyer and really a good student, and he was really smart. That made him extraordinarily dangerous to the left. And you can't look at histories and things that try to deal with Nixon's career without always trying to figure out where the person's coming from who's writing it. Because on the left, the, the, the scars are so deep. And yet we now know as a matter of pure fact that Nixon's attack on Alger Hiss was exactly right. The man was in effect a traitor. But even today, you will find people who would totally repudiate that and say it's utterly inappropriate and I probably could get banned from, well, not since Musk, but before Musk, I could have been banned from Twitter uh, for having written that or said it. So what you, the last thing I want to say, because I, I deeply admire President Nixon, and, and I deeply admire his patriotism, his commitment to America, his courage, his work ethic, his willingness to learn. I think it's important as we take all of these ideas and we think about the current elections, we think about the near future, we should take from Nixon a dedication to understanding what America needs to be safe, to be prosperous, to be free. And a willingness, no matter what the heat, no matter what the attacks, no matter what the viciousness, a willingness to stand up and tell the truth in a belief that over time, the truth in fact does win out in a free society. And I think if you look at the total arc of Nixon's career all the way up through his post-presidency, he is one of the most consequential people in American history. Uh, someone once wrote an article and said that it, that it occurred to her that her entire life had been taken up by people who were for or against Richard Nixon. And it was literally true, I think, up until he passed away, that, 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 that for an entire generation, he'd been that central. So we have two challenges. One is a sort of intellectual, technical challenge. How do you think strategically? How do you implement strategically? But the other is, how do you find these people? How do you find that rare person who in fact is capable of not just thinking strategically, but of methodically and steadily overcome all the problems and with a sort of deliberate persistence achieving the goals that they think are necessary for the country? And I think in that sense that, that uh, both the Nixon Library and the Nixon Foundation are very important centers from which we can learn a lot more about what it will take for America to survive. And I can tell you for both Cliss and me how honored we are to have been allowed to come here and to be part of this very first Grand Strategy Summit and how much we think that this is really important for the country's future. Learning from the people who have done it is one of the real keys to being successful, getting the next generation to do it. And in that sense, I think the foundation and the library play a very key role in America's future. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Speaker Newt Gingrich.